Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mama Wears Athleisure. I am your host, Mariella de Santiago, a first time mom. We focus on all things mom with tips to help make life easier and more organized for all you mamas out there. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about toddlers brushing their teeth and flossing and how to help them out if this is a struggle for anyone out there. So we have Milka, who is a pediatric dentist, that's going to give us all of the tips, everything we need to know, ways to help us so that this becomes more of an exciting task for little ones instead of a challenge. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here and be a resource to your community. I am a pediatric dentist, which means I went to dental school, undergrad, and then dental school. And then after that, decided, you know what? I don't want to just treat adults and actually don't want to treat adults anymore. And now I only treat children. So I went for additional schooling for that and making sure that kids are kind of a moving target because they're always growing and developing. So making sure that we're addressing all of those needs. I'm also the owner of Positive Pediatric Dentistry, which is my own dental office. And we just opened a couple of months ago. And my goal with opening our office is to be able to provide personalized care and meet families where they're at and provide solutions that are specific to their needs. And I'm happy to answer any questions that your community has on all things toddler and teething and brushing. So I'm excited to be here. Well, first of all, congratulations on just opening your own office. That is so exciting. And Thank I'm sure you. so, so much work, so stressful, all the things, right? So that is amazing. So I'll just go ahead and start off with probably one of the most asked questions for from parents. If they, if a parent has a child that doesn't really want their teeth brushed, how can a parent help them out or encourage them? to brush their teeth. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess I have a two-part answer. If they're already a toddler who's having a hard time, we'll tackle that in the second part. But the best thing to help avoid that is starting early. So as early as birth, really, when there's really no teeth in the mouth, that's a really great time when changing diapers to work on desensitizing in the oral cavity, scrubbing the gums, keeping the area clean, making sure that there's good movement of the area, and also making sure that as we're consuming beverages, such as breast milk or formula, depending on what mom and baby's path is, that everything is being cleansed, helps avoid things like thrush or candidiasis, but also it helps desensitize from having someone else come in and help clean. Sometimes if the first time we are doing that is when teeth are already present, it takes a little bit for the child to get used to that. So biggest thing is starting early. The second step is like, okay, we're already here. We can't time travel. What do we do now is making it fun. There's lots of different ways to make it fun. And as each parent knows, each child is so different. So there's not like one magical trick that can be applied to all children. But fun is definitely a good answer because it can look differently. So first thing, make sure that in making it fun, feel free to make it a little messy and not always have to brush in the bathroom. So if we're brushing in the living room, they may feel more comfortable sitting rather than being kind of like a moving target that parents are trying to reach and could accidentally gag them. Now they really don't want you to brush their teeth. If they're sitting down against a sofa or laying on the floor, they have one direction where they're stable and it allows the parent to have more control over where they're brushing and minimize any potential gagging or injuries where the child can become a little standoffish. Also, another fun technique that I use when kids come into the office and they're feeling a little nervous is asking them their favorite animal sounds and getting them to roar helps open big. And then is there a little dinosaur back there? Let me see. And they sometimes just get a good giggle out of it. But when they're doing those animal sounds, they're opening and it allows for you to get to all those nooks and crannies you're trying to get to. If there are older siblings, that's another great way to make it fun. That monkey see monkey do. Older siblings, if they're like, I want to be like, 
Billy or Joey or whoever, they see the older sibling brushing or flossing, now they're going to want to partake. Or even seeing their parents having a great time brushing for a two-minute song could encourage them. So it's just really about getting creative. So I love all of those things that you mentioned. Yeah. Yes, getting creative and fun. Like we have a little song that we make up. But when it comes to if a child has a difficult time brushing their teeth, I can only imagine that flossing is much harder, especially with like little babies when they maybe only have like two to four teeth, right? You're not really flossing because they don't, they, all they have are gaps. (laughs) So it depends. So most kids only have gaps and we love gaps as pediatric dentists, those gaps mean that we're going to have enough space for these bigger teeth that are going to come in later on. But when teeth that are coming in are all really, really, really close together, and there are not gaps, as soon as two teeth are touching, that's when flossing needs to be introduced. So unfortunately, for some kiddos, that's as soon as their babies, if all their teeth are coming in touching, then we really do need to be flossing. Um, Even if it's with a little flosser, our changing table. But then again, the earlier we introduce it, the easier it is to incorporate. My son also loves flossing. I love it because I love flossing. (laughs) Good. Yeah. And kids really mirror their parents. And a lot of the dental anxiety that I see sometimes in kids comes from the fear that their parents have. So just being cognizant of that so that kids can have a very positive experience. I think one of the probably harder things that parents struggle with as well is determining like what toothpaste should parents be using? There are so many options, right? Yeah. And as a parent, you just like want nothing but the best, but sometimes it's the options are overwhelming that we just need a little bit of guidance. Like what's going to be the best? <laughs> yeah. So our guidelines for the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry is that as soon as a tooth comes in the mouth, we recommend a smear amount or rice grain amount of fluoridated toothpaste on a toothbrush morning and night. And then once the child is three, then we upgrade to a pea size amount. So that's enough that the tooth is getting some extra strength with the fluoride, but it's not enough to cause any concerns with their digestion or anything like that. There are other alternatives to fluoride if parents would like to go that route. But I think the best advice there is that as soon as the first tooth is in the mouth within the first six months, and then by latest the first birthday, it's really good for this child to have a dental home because each family is different. And then they can go to a provider that knows that family and how they want to live and eat and all of the nuances of their family and provide recommendations based off of their life. And the next very fun topic, cavities. (laughs) Unfortunately. (laughs) Yes, I know, right? Because we can't always brush after we eat certain foods, but what foods should we be kind of more mindful of that can cause cavities? And what are maybe some tips to avoid getting cavities, which I mean, I don't know. I don't know if they are avoidable or not. Hey, I'm Amanda Gurman, host of the Honest as a Mother podcast. Join me every week to have an open and honest conversation about what motherhood is actually like. Let's ditch the perfect mom persona and let moms everywhere know that they're not alone. Listen each week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, so cavities are common, but they are preventable. However, we live in a society where a lot of our foods are very quick and we're always on the go. So that makes it a little bit more challenging for busy families and parents. But the way cavities work, it's really a combination of, it's almost like a triple Venn diagram. So you have bacteria and the acidity of your mouth, whether it's acidic or basic, what bacteria live in there. And that's one circle. The other circle is the teeth themselves. Do genetically, do you have softer teeth? Do you have strong teeth? What does this look like for that child? And then there's also diet and hygiene habits. And that's another circle. What are we eating and how are we taking care of them? And how all of those things play together kind of help us indicate if we're at risk for a cavity, at a high risk or at a low risk. And that's something that the dentist will um, help assess and then provide some guidelines. But generally speaking, things higher in starch 
and or sugar, a fermentable carbohydrate, will be more at risk for having a cavity. So for example, some of the snacks we all think of, we think gummy bears. Yeah, definitely not good for your teeth. But another snack that's very sneaky is goldfish, Cheez-Its, because they break down as simple sugar and the bacteria don't discriminate. And when they get stuck in between those teeth that are touching each other, if that floss is not going down in there and scrub it, then it can cause a cavity. Or another one I see a lot is gummy vitamins or even like melatonin vitamins, because if they're gummies and we brushed, we floss, we did all of the things, we drank water, we weren't drinking juice or soda, great. But then we just had a gummy vitamin right before bed and we're like, oh, it's a, it's a vitamin. But because of that gelatin and sugary substrate, it, it can cause a cavity. So just being very aware of kind of the timing of everything because our mouth gets very acidic at night and that's when we're more at risk for cavities. And I think another very important topic or something that we think about often as moms, pacifiers and the thumb sucking, right? It's always a, some kids like it, some kids don't. And yeah. there's always right, a preference, but you can't always just suddenly take away the thumb yeah. or the pacifier. So when should a toddler stop with yeah. one or the other, both really? And what are some ways to help encourage them to stop? I, I imagine that a pacifier is easier because yes. it's, <laughs> it's not object. attached to the child. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, the suck swallow reflex, which is what really all of this comes down to, is a very natural reflex that babies have as soon as they come into this world. And the first couple you know, months of life, this is how they're getting their nutrition. This is how they're soothing and regulating a lot of their nervous system. So pacifiers and thumb sucking habits sometimes will start as early as that. Now, if we're not able to integrate that reflex, we may want to continue that on for a longer period of time. So my recommendation is in the first six months of life, there is there are studies that show that you know incidence of SIDS is decreased with a pacifier. So by all means, if your baby wants a pacifier, please do. Our guidelines are to stop the habit by three, whether it's thumb or pacifier. But there are no real studies that show any benefit within those six months to that three years of age as of now. But I find that the children that continue that habit all the way to three, it's much harder to stop. So those first six months of life, great. But after those six months of life, now the child is learning to chew. So something that we want to encourage, something like baby led weaning, chew, chewing toys, teething toys, working on that skill and kind of reducing the habit or the thumb or the pacifier is a great time to do that. Alternatives, I brought my little Mayo Munchie and it's shaped kind of like a mouth guard, but it helps stimulate the baby to chew and put the tongue exactly where it needs to go to help the overall shape of the face. And that is a great like habit replacement tool. Like you said, way easier with a pacifier than with a thumb. Other things to look at are why if they're doing this for an extended period of time, like now we're seven and we're still sucking our thumb, looking at possible reasons why we may still be doing that. Um, what's going on in terms of airway or other things like that. Thanks for all those tips. And I will definitely link that Mayo Munchie. Is that what you called it? Yeah. And yeah, Mayo Munchie to... has a little like map of different providers that recommend the appliance. So if anyone's looking for providers that are aware to ask more questions, they can check that out. Okay. That, so anyone that's interested, it'll be linked in the show notes. And then finally, my last question, do you have any other tips, suggestions, or recommendations for any parents out there that are just looking for some guidance and support with this brushing and flossing? Yeah, I would say getting a dental home sooner rather than later. And if there's a pediatric dentist near you, that could be a great asset to your child or toddler who's having a hard time, maybe at your family dentist or general dentist. We specialize with kids. So everything is child friendly in our office from the moment you walk through our doors, we have a little door, we have a little toilet, we have a little sink. 
our office is really geared towards that child that's maybe a little nervous to make them feel at home. And then in terms of recommendations and getting rid of a pacifier, another option is Frida, which is a great baby line. They also have a weaning system for a pacifier that helps kind of transition from one that has like a bigger nipple all the way down to no nipple. And it was made by a pediatric dentist. So that's another great resource. But if I can ever be of help, I'm happy to. I can put my information and I'm happy to be a resource to the community. And at the end of the day, I just want families and children to smile big and have healthy smiles. Thank you. And I really love that you mentioned the pediatric dentist piece, how it's the office is very different because yeah, my son goes to a pediatric dentist and he walks in and there's a bunch of toys and it's so yeah. inviting and there's, it's just fun. And then afterwards he gets to get stickers and he picks a toy from the toy chest. So it's not like a, a scary, first of all, no offense to you. I'm not a fan of the dentist. No. So I, I love the feeling afterwards of getting my teeth cleaned, but the whole process, it's not. Yeah. A, it's, it's a not very vulnerable I, position. To be in. Yeah. So if you can really reduce that anxiety for kids, yes, pediatric dentist definitely recommend it all the way because it's just a much more inviting atmosphere. So thanks yes. for mentioning that. Of course. And you hope you never have a dental emergency for your child, but you want them to be in a place where they feel safe and welcome. So if there is an emergency, it's not the first time they're seeing this place or meeting this dentist, it makes it a lot easier to be able to work through how to take care of them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on and chatting and sharing all of this. I'll have your info linked in the show notes. If anybody is wanting to reach out, they can connect to you through there. Sounds great. Thanks again. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for our next episode. You can find us on Instagram for more updates and tips. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a review if you like us.